These days, caring for our pet extends far beyond just providing food, water, and a little cuddle time. Professionals say pet owners will do just about anything to keep Fido and Fluffy happy, healthy, and safe. And that includes health and medical treatment reserved for us humans. On this episode of the Paw Report, we're joined by Dr. Gregory Moth from the Kaskaskia Valley Animal Hospital in Sullivan to talk about some human health trends that have gone to the dogs and cats. So stay with us. Oka Vet Clinic in Tuscola and Dr. Sally Foote remind you to properly take care of your pets and are happy to help support the Paw Report on WEIU. Oka Vet Clinic located at 140 West Sale Street in downtown Tuscola. More information available at okavetclinic.com. Dave's Decorating Center is a proud supporter of the Paw Report on WEIU. Dave's Decorating Center features the Mohawk Smart Strand Silk Forever Clean Carpet. Dave's Decorating Center, authorized Mohawk Color Center in Charleston. From keepers to sleepers, we're talking about the latest faddish trends when it comes to our pets. And joining us on this episode of the Paw Report is Dr. Gregory Mock from the Kaskaskia Valley Animal Hospital over in Sullivan, Illinois. And we're so glad that you've joined us again. You know, this is a very interesting topic. And you even told me, you said, now some of the things that I may have to say today may not, you know, may not rub everybody the right way. But I think it's important topics that we, we talk about, some of the trends that are out there and maybe some things that you need to alert pet owners too and when I think of trends I think the first thing that I think of is probably food and diet right yeah well one thing I want to say about fads um, you know back in the 70s I had <laughs> you, some you leisure went through suits. Some fads. <laughs> yes I had uh, platform shoes and a um, light blue leisure suit and and all that so and that's the one thing with fads is that uh, there's not a lot of substance to them and that's why they're fads Mm -hmm. So, um, so a lot of these things we're going to talk about today don't have a lot of substance to them. They're faddish things. They'll hope come, hopefully go. Um, but um, so we're going to be uh, maybe rubbing some people the wrong way or skewing a few yeah. sacred cows. But um, why do you think they come into play? Is it is it what we're seeing online, social media, TV? Yeah, and I, I think all fads over the years have been you know like that things pop up, people want to try them, they look at them, hear other people having success with them maybe. Um, but uh, things nowadays, you know, kind of move at hyper speed with social media and things. And um, But you mentioned diets. Yes, gluten-free, right. grain-free, organic, antioxidants, probiotics. I mean, the list is endless. Right. Now, some of those things you mentioned are, are good. Um, some of them are, are not good. So diet specifically, the one thing that I really like to hammer home is that raw diets are not a good diet. And then people say, well, it doesn't make any sense. That's, that's mm -hmm. completely natural. But it's not natural if you think about it. Um, what is a raw diet? Well, people feed raw meats, things like that, things that aren't cooked. Um, and that's what do animals do eat out in the Wild. Um, wild, but a dog, a coyote, for example, out in the wild um, catches a rabbit and eats it. That is not the same as going to the store and buying beef or chicken and feeding it to your dog raw. That rabbit is actually fairly clean and sterile, surprisingly. But when we go through the process of producing meats, then there is um, possibility of things getting contaminated. Things like chicken and things get contaminated with salmonella, E. coli, those things. And so we need to cook commercial products to make sure that we kill things that get in there. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're feeding raw chicken or beef or something to your diet or to your dog um, or cat, then they can pick up all those nasty um, organisms that would be killed by cooking. It's just not the same as them, you know, like a cat catching a mouse and eating mm -hmm. it. That mouse hasn't had the chance to be, it's, it's alive and then it's dead and then it's eaten. Things don't have time to contaminate the meat. Um, so 
So that's a very, very big one. There is absolutely nothing in a raw diet that gives your animal any nutritional benefit whatsoever. And a matter of fact, a lot of things are much more easily digested and absorbed once they're cooked. Proteins are broken down so that they're easier to digest. Um, a lot of vitamins um, are e more easily digestible and absorbed once they're cooked. So there, there is no real benefit to a raw diet. What about grain free? We talked about gluten, antioxidants. Yeah. Now, probiotics. Um, right, grain-free diets make slightly more sense um, because then you think, you know, dogs and cats are carnivores. Um, dogs are not pure carnivores. Cats pretty much are. That's about all cats eat are um, meats, you know, meat animals. Dogs eat a little more um, types of vegetable matter and things. You've seen dogs eating grass and things. So they eat a little more of that type of stuff, but they're mainly carnivores. So a grain-free diet would make sense. And so if you have a properly produced, commercially made um, grain-free diet that has all the vitamins, minerals, everything it needs in it, that's an okay choice. On the other hand, there's really nothing wrong with eating, like a dog eating in grains. dry food, grains, as long as it's produced properly. Those grains um, have the same, you know, proteins, vitamins, things like that in them too. So there's nothing really wrong with eating grains. The one that makes no sense are vegetarian diets for dogs and cats. Um, and usually this is a situation where someone themselves is a vegetarian um, or they have some reason like that that they don't want to feed their dog meat or their cat and um, that makes no sense whatsoever. And in my opinion, feeding a meat-free diet to a carnivore, you know, borders on animal abuse, just to be frank. And so that one I have a real big problem with. Um, so the other things you mentioned like probiotics, those are excellent. Um, there's nothing in the world, I mean, probiotics are not going to hurt you, they're only going to help you. Mm -hmm. um, you may not need them, um, but they're, they're not going to do anything, you know, badly. So I take probiotics myself, I'm kind of a health nut, and, um, you know, I think they do, you know, excellent for me. So, but there's, there's nothing bad in a probiotic, mm -hmm. again, commercially prepared thing for that animal. Mm -hmm. um, we use uh, not a lot in our practice, but we use them sometimes, especially for chronic GI issues, they can be quite helpful. There's other things called prebiotics that can be added to diets, and they can be good too. Um, they can cause some issues, nothing dangerous. Prebiotics are fibers and things like that that promote a good gut environment for the proper bacteria to live. Probiotics, you're actually eating the bacteria. Prebiotics are things that promote a good environment for bacteria to live. So, um, you know, a lot of them are different types of fiber, vegetable fibers of different digestibility that produce the right pH and amount of fiber in the gut so that you have a nice environment for nice bacteria to live in. So, let's talk about another fad um, is designer breeds. Yes. Um, you've seen them, you've probably dealt with them, you've studied right. them. What's out there now? What's what's the trend? Well, the bad thing way? with a designer breed is that they are um, sold a lot of times as a purebred. And they really are just a mixed breed dog. So we'll get people who will take two different breeds, mix them together, and then call them a different breed. So they'll take like a Shih Tzu and mix them with the Chihuahua and they call them a Chai Shu Shu or something like that. And they sell them for purebred Chai Shu Shus for $800. Or, you know, it's just, they're just multiple, multiple ones of those types of things. And those are mixed breed dogs. So I have a real problem personally with paying a lot of money for a mixed breed dog. Um, we got our last dog from the Robinson Animal Shelter. A uh, little shout out to them, they're great people over there. And our, um, our dog's half Labrador and half Great Pyrenees. And she's a nice mixed breed dog. And she's a really good dog and she has very good qualities from both of those breeds in her. Um, but I'm certainly not gonna go out and pay $1,000 for a mixed breed dog personally. 
Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, so I have a, a problem with that. Um, is there any with, particular crossbreeding that's really, you know, prominent right now between two breeds? Yeah, you know, the, uh, there's a lot of breeds, large breeds being mixed with poodles. So you have like um, golden doodles and labradoodles and things. And they're actually a, a nice cross. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of those dogs are really good dogs. And, and the good thing about having a mixed breed is that you dilute out recessive genes that show up in purebred dogs. So there is a, I mean, a nice mixed breed dog is, is excellent. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times there's a healthier dog and it has less problems. So I don't have any problem at all with dogs being, having mixed breed dogs. I think they're great. And that's the dogs that you for the have. most part that <laughs> I've had. Um, but I just don't like people coming in, hey, I've got this new purebred whatever, or I have a, I we had somebody come in one time, it said they had a new purebred Morrington dog. And I was like, what is a Morrington? And then I got to look in the papers and f found out it was a cross between a Maltese and something else, I don't even remember. Mm. Um, but they were being sold as purebred Morringtons. And, and so these people, in my opinion, were um, defrauded, mm -hmm. basically, because they were being and sold that bill a of lot goods. For this um, so if you buy a mixed breed dog, which is perfectly fine for to go out and get a Labradoodle and things, and they are going to cost you, but be aware that you are getting a mixed breed dog and that you probably can go to the animal shelter and find a dog with the quality, a mixed breed dog with those qualities you want um, and give a, you know, an, or, you know, an animal pet. a home. <laughs> and do it for a lot less, so. Dr. Mock, another, another fad that we're seeing, which you'll have to shed some light on why it may be happening, is uh, vaccination avoidance. Yes, yes. And I, as a pet owner, I mean, that's just, that's right. just what you do. You take them to get vaccinated yes. every year. So what and is- this, uh, this um, also flows over into the human side of things. There's been a lot of issues over the past 20 years about vaccines and people do vaccines cause autism for example that has been completely disproven uh, matter of fact the original study that that came from out of england um, was completely fraudulently produced the people that produced it had that they wanted to prove that and they skewed their results so they would get that result um, so that's been completely turned over. That does not cause autism in people. In animals, the big issue is cats that supposedly get tumors from vaccines. So they'll have a vaccine reaction and develop a very nasty tumor. So that probably does happen occasionally. The numbers of cats that get vaccine associated tumors and all the studies they've looked at is anywhere from one in 10,000 to one in 40,000 animals. So, so someone sitting home, gosh, e even if my cat has a one in 10,000 chance, I, I don't want to get that vaccine. I would be, it'd be horrible if he had a tumor. Well, you have to look at um, benefits versus risks. Anything you do in life has a risk. So it's just like, I mean, you could take something as simple as eating. Well, if I, decide I'm going to eat, there is a tiny chance that I could choke to death. So, but on the other hand, the benefit is it's going to keep me alive. If I don't eat, I'm gonna die. So either way I go, there's risk. Well, if I don't eat, the risk is 100% I'm gonna die. If I do eat, the risk is maybe one out of 100,000 chance I'm gonna choke to death. So I'm gonna say, yeah, even though I could choke to death, I'm gonna go ahead and eat because I know if I don't, I'm gonna die. Mm -hmm. Vaccines are like that. So we can look at this cat and kind of mix those studies and say it's a one out of 25,000 chance your cat's gonna get a vaccine tumor and die from it. Well, if we don't vaccinate cats, 10% of them are gonna die from infectious disease. They're gonna get distemper, um, feline leukemia, on and on. Um, if we don't vaccinate. So I, here's how I've explained it to people. Let's say you're walking down the street and 
someone's throwing pianos out of windows <laughs> and you have a 10% chance of being smashed by a piano. So that's be not being vaccinated. I have a, my cat has a 10% chance it's gonna get feline leukemia or something and die from it. So, or I could run across the street and get away from the pianos. If I run across the street, there's a one out of 25,000 chance I'm gonna get hit by a car and get killed. So I got to think, well, what's my biggest risk? To stand here and a 10% chance I'm going to get smashed by a piano or a one out of 25,000 chance I'm going to get hit by a car running across the street to get away from them. Well, I'm going to run across the street, obviously. So it's the same numbers. If you don't vaccinate your cat, there's a 10% chance that it's going to die of an infectious disease that could have been prevented. Mm -hmm. If you do vaccinate him, yes, there's a one out of 25,000 chance he could get a vaccine tumor, but it's way, way, way lower than not vaccinating him. So that's how I look at it. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's, and that's the same thing with all of our um, vaccines, any other treatments, anything we do, things could go wrong. If I just give simple amoxicillin um, to an animal, they could have a severe allergic reaction to it, but if I don't, then they could die of their, or get very sick from their infection. From their infection, sure. Um, boarding. Um, mm -hmm. There is some trends going on in boarding that you've noticed recently. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about what that might be. So communal boarding? Yeah, there's um, some places who will, um, when the animals are boarded, um, let them all play together. There's also like air at places that do daycare for animals and people that don't have anywhere to put their animal during the day or something and they'll take it and leave it at the boarding facility for the day while they're at work. Well, some of these facilities then allow all the, just like say there are a bunch of kids at daycare, they go outside and all play together. Um, well, there's big issues with that with dogs as opposed to little kids. Um, one thing is that there's lots of injuries that can occur, bite wounds, things like that. Some animals just don't mix very well. And the other thing is, and I have a story I can tell you about that. Um, the other thing also is transfer of diseases. When you, we look at studies of, um, if I just grabbed 100, and the next 100 dogs I saw walking around here in Charleston and tested them, a certain percentage of them are going to have intestinal parasites. And so dogs being dogs, they really, they don't, like a little kid would go inside and use the bathroom. Well, a dog at daycare is not going to do that. He's just going to go to the bathroom right there. And the average dog who say has hookworms, each female hookworm produces 200,000 eggs per day. So let's say that dog has 100, even 100 hookworms. Well, he's passing out 20 million eggs a day. Mm -hmm. And so every time he goes to the stool, there's millions and millions of worm eggs in there. And even if they get it fairly quickly, pick it up, the dog steps in it, he's just track, 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 track. Mm -hmm. So these areas get, can, can get very rapidly infested mm -hmm. with parasites. Uh -huh. um, so that bothers me immensely right there, that they're not kept, when they're taken to those areas, they're not kept um, in an area that can be cleaned properly. They're let out into grassy areas to play all together, and that's just a really good way to spread disease. We had a client um, a couple years ago that was going to do that with his dog, was going to board it at a facility that um, did, and he thought it'd be great while they're gone, the dog could play, be with all their buddies, and, and he asked us what we thought about it. And we said, well, we don't think that's a very good idea. And so they, it happened anyway. And so about two days into the boarding, they called us, they came home early, got the dog, brought it to us and a huge gash down the dog's side, literally eight to 10 inches long. That had occurred while the dogs were out playing and was attacked by another dog. Oh. And so, you know, we had to do a fairly major reconstruction of this dog's shoulder area. Um, to fix that. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so I have a big problem with mixing a bunch of um, animals together who don't know each other. Mm -hmm. um, that's, a, you know, talking about the large animal side of things. I mean, that's something that just in the large animal area, 
everyone knows not never to do. You would not take a bunch of cows from this area, a bunch of pigs, mix them with a bunch of ones they've never been around. You're going to have a bunch of dominant situations, disease being spread, and it just there's no there's nothing good about it, and there's only lots of bad mm -hmm. things. So. In the last couple of minutes, I think another thing that we talked about is um, dental care uh, is a fad and there's a specific fad with that. So in our last couple of minutes, let's talk about dental cleaning without anesthesia. Yes, there's been, um, that's been popping up in places. Whenever we clean a dog's teeth um, or a cat, keep saying dog, but both, um, it's not like a person. They're not gonna go sit in the chair and say all and do all these things and sit and cooperate. Um, they may sit fairly still, some of them, but a lot of the dental things we have to do are fairly painful and not horribly painful, but done without anesthesia, they kind of hurt. And so uh, when I've had my teeth cleaned, it's uncomfortable. I'm getting this pick placed in here and it kind of hurts a little. Mm -hmm. Well, if the dog's struggling, even if he's a really good dog, you can't really do that without anesthesia. And the reason we have to do things like, for example, take a fairly sharp instrument, go up under the gum line, and it's called root planing, and cut down and take the tartar off. The main, you know, when we look at a dog's mouth or a cat's mouth, and you're like, oh, that looks horrible, and you have all this brown tartar on their teeth, that's not the worst part of the disease. That looks bad. The real disease is up in the socket, the tooth socket, up under the gum line. That's where we have to get up there to really clean the teeth. And that can get very touchy and painful. Mm -hmm. If you're up underneath the edge of the gum line, past the enamel, you're to exposed root and dentin. Right. Well, those structures have nerve endings that come out. And if you're scraping on those, that hurts. Well, you can't properly do that with an animal that's awake um, to clean that up there. And lots of animals, the dentals we see are far worse than what human dental people see. Um, it's scary. I've talked to, um, you know, dental, human dental people and, you know, and, and uh, you know, and it's just, it's a lot worse. And so you can't clean that off properly. The other thing too, if you do a, a partial job, let's just say you, you scrape the teeth, it would, you could almost, it would be almost impossible to polish the tooth surface um, with, uh, without anesthesia. And so, and groomers will do this too. They'll scrape and break stuff off. Well, then you end up leaving a lot of very rough surface. Also, you gouge the surface of the, um, enamel and that all needs to be polished and smoothed off or it leaves perfect spots for bacteria to jump right back into and take off again. When you're cleaning up under the gum line, you can release bacteria into the bloodstream. And so a lot of times um, we end up having to do antibiotics and things along with the dental cleaning um, afterwards. And, and it's just not, it just leads to a, a much more dangerous situation if you're scraping and cleaning that stuff off and not doing a full proper job right. of it. Lots of information for pet owners to think about um, and there's I'm sure there's lots of other things that we could talk about but you did provide some good information uh, to share with all of us today so thank you for <laughs> yep. joining us for Glad this episode. Always, so. always interesting with Dr. Mock. <laughs> we'll see you again next time and thank you for joining us on this episode of The Paw Report. If you're a veterinarian, trainer, groomer, specialist, rescue organization, or shelter that would like to partner with The Paw Report by providing expert guests for the show, please contact us by emailing weiu at weiu.net or call 217-581-5956. If you have a topic you'd like to see on the show or questions for our experts, contact us with those too. To many, they're considered a lost cause, banished to years behind bars with futures that don't look so bright. But a group of inmates in Massachusetts is working hard to give some unloved dogs a second chance. Dan Robichard reports in this Paw Report Extra. Hey, this is overload for him. <laughs> Those of us who have dogs 
know what this moment feels like. It was like a, almost like an emotional homecoming. <laughs> it was it was great to see. Him. A homecoming because Hershey returned to the man who trained her. Richie just happens to live for now behind bars. I don't care if people behind those walls find God or they find a dog. Sheriff Lou Evangelitis of Worcester County launched a program a year ago called Project Good Dog. Inmates from his work release program have been taught to train dogs that are considered at first unadoptable. They work with a local animal shelter called Second Chance. Why inmates? What is the one thing that the rest of us don't have? I fight. Okay. That's time. Double time. There you go. They're here, they've got the time, they can put the effort in that most people don't have in their day-to-day -day life. Yeah, want to roll for me? Yeah, you remember, that's my buddy. The dogs actually live in the cells with the inmates for several weeks. As you can imagine, things can get pretty tense here in the cell block, especially during the summer months, but the sheriff told me once you bring the dogs in here, you can feel the atmosphere among the inmates really change. The officers tell us that the stress has dropped dramatically, that the dogs have a way of kind of being adopted by the entire block, and because of that, it's a safer environment. Friday, on the one-year anniversary of the program, some of the 20 dogs adopted came back with their new owners. The program's phenomenal. It's amazing to me what they come in with and what they leave with. And what do the inmates get out of it? I've been here for a few years. They come over here and get the opportunity handle dogs and see them come from, you know, not good situations and help them, you know, reconnect with people. Animals and men, both behind bars at some point in their lives, both yearning for freedom. Dave's Decorating Center is a proud supporter of the Power Report on WEIU. Dave's Decorating Center features the Mohawk Smart Strand Silk Forever Clean Carpet. Dave's Decorating Center, Authorized Mohawk Color Center in Charleston. Okaw Vet Clinic in Tuscola and Dr. Sally Foote remind you to properly take care of your pets and are happy to help support the Paw Report on WEIU. Okaw Vet Clinic located at 140 West Sale Street in downtown Tuscola. More information available at okawvetclinic.com.